Well, hello and welcome to uh, Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival 2021. Um, it's wonderful to be in front of a live audience again. Is that still squealing too much? A bit? If I switch it off, can everyone hear me? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, oh, would you like me to move over here so you're more central? Oh, no, that's, good. that's good. Okay. Um, well, again, welcome to uh, this wonderful live crime writing festival. Um, and welcome to, uh, to those in the room and also to everyone joining us on Zoom and including those throughout New South Wales who are watching from your local library or from home courtesy of your local library. It's wonderful to have people with us both in person and virtually. Um, before we go any further, uh, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, and pay my respects to them as the traditional owners of this land, uh, unceded land, uh, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name's Meg Keneally and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Metcalf Auditorium today for this interview with Larissa Berendt, um, who I'm delighted to be sitting here with. Now, before we get started, I just have to do a few short housekeeping announcements. Um, as you will have seen, we're following COVID protocols. We're all double vaxxed. We're all checked in with our QR codes and um, everyone is asked to keep their masks on, except when you're eating, drinking or on stage. Um, please mute your mobile phones and don't record the session. And if you're taking photos, please turn off the flash. Uh, feel free to share on social media um, using at bad crime, bad crime Sydney or hashtag bad, bad crime Sydney. And um, we'll have uh, about 15 minutes of questions after the conversation. So if, you, if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, send your questions through using the chat function uh, about 20 minutes before the end. Um, we also won't have microphones for audience questions. So if you speak nice and loudly, if you're asking a question from the audience, that would be great. And now about Larissa Berendt. Um, she is Distinguished Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, and uh, Director of Research and Academic Programs at the Jambani Institute of Indigenous Education and Research. She's also the host of Speaking Out on ABC Radio. She's published numerous textbooks as well as award-winning novels, Home and Legacy, and most recently, After Story, which we're discussing today. Um, and she's also an awarded filmmaker among many other honors. It's so wonderful to be here with you in person. Thank you. It's lovely to be here with you too, and I'll just join in acknowledging that we're on Gadigal country. Fantastic. Now, I have read this book three times, and I reviewed it for The Australian, and I really get something more out of it um, each time. Uh, and this is a crime writers festival. There are two murders in this book which which are deeply affecting and several other crimes as well um but it centers uh around the relationship between two women before we get into the uh crime aspects of it could you tell us a little bit about Della and Jasmine and their story yes um so the book is uh, I guess a mother-daughter story uh with Della and her daughter and really the heart of it is looking at the impact of a murder in the family decades before and how that's really affected their mother-daughter relationship. And the book itself is set as the two of them go on a literary tour around uh, England, looking at the sites that meant a lot to Jasmine when she was growing up and reading the canon. Um, Jasmine is university educated, Della not so, um, but very down to earth and very wise in her own way. So um, yeah, I won't say more than that, but I think that's the structure of the book was to place my two characters in this setting so that they could explore those thematics of the impact of, of that particular crime and uh, how it's played out since. Yeah, it's um, a fascinating novel. And at one point, Jasmine, who, who's a lawyer, says that link between justice and fairness that you think is going to be there never is. And that's something that... <coughs> pardon me, that reverberates uh, throughout the book. Um, and uh, it, uh, I'd love to, uh, if you could explore a little bit about how 
uh, the justice system treats people, and particularly with regard to the reaction of the police to the disappearance of Jasmine's sister versus the reaction to the disappearance of another little girl 25 years later. Mm. And these, I think we see that a lot. And I guess even sort of when you start at law school, it's not unusual that the lecturers will first point out that there is a big difference between justice and fairness. And, you know, I think the more you work in the legal system and um, I do have the role at UTS, but we run a clinic through Jumbana. So we do quite a lot of work in the child protection space and a lot of work in the criminal justice space. Um, we also do a lot of work with um, deaths in custody, uh, coronial inquests and supporting families through that. Um, and um, through all of that, you know, we've got these, these different interactions with the criminal justice system, both as sort of family support, academics, policy makers, but also as lawyers. And I think as you work in those systems, there are so many times when you realise that, that that is true and that what people need when something terrible has happened to them or to somebody that they love, it's impossible to get that through the way our criminal justice system works. And in fact, what you can often see is that that system and the attempt to get justice through it is re-traumatising. Um, so I guess for me, that was a big thematic about, about that. But as you say, you know, this, this was, the book was inspired by, um, a range of cases that I'd worked on, um, both with families of victims of crime, but also families who had had a death in custody. And the, you know, I think one of the things where this, this plays out is that as time goes on, what kind of shocked me was how often you would hear people who were outside of that family say to them, you know, it's time to move on. You know, you should find some closure somehow and move on, um, which felt very shocking to me. Um, so I, I, I felt like it was important to have our main characters be in a situation where the initial investigation failed them. And that is not unusual for the time that I've set this, that police would not take the disappearance of Aboriginal children seriously. Um, and, and the book very much echoes in that sense how it was for the Bowerville families when their three children went missing and police used terms like the kids of Von Walkabout. It was treated as a child neglect case, not an, a homicide. And the implications of that kind of, those, those assumptions, those racist assumptions, to be frank, were that evidence wasn't collected and people could not be prosecuted. So there's a kind of wound that was um, additionally um, created there. And, and that is not uncommon. Um, I see that a lot in my work about those assumptions being made. So you can feel that that is unjust when you see it in those circumstances. And then when you um, compare it to the way uh, that um, people swing into action when there is a, another child missing, it does give an additional hurt to families because their child wasn't treated the same way. And it certainly um, is the case that when we saw um, the little girl in WA, Chloe, disappear, the kind of reaction that that got is the kind of reaction that every child should have when they go missing. And it was very painful to a couple of clients we had in WA whose children were reported missing, one child in particular, baby Charlie, um, who was reported missing when um, the family knew he was in danger and the police waited a very long time to get into action and in that time that child was killed. The additional pain of seeing that and just sort of finally in relation to this, you know, that the part of that seed for me writing the book came from hearing a very senior member of the legal profession say to the families of one of our victims of crime about their child, you know, really you should get some count counselling and try and move on and it struck me at that moment that this person would never have said that to Daniel Morecambe's parents would never have said that to another parent and I just um you know it's it struck me at, that um people could be so insensitive about it and and I think for Aboriginal parents particularly there's a deep wound because I think there's many ways in which there are assumptions that Aboriginal parents don't care about their children as much. I see that as a very negative stereotype in a range of things. I see it in the child protection cases all the time. Um, so, yeah, particularly with that First Nations lens through that 
justice and fairness are two different things. Um, I felt like there was a lot to unpack when I started to put this novel together. Yeah, it, it's huge because we have another um, missing girl um, it, it, who goes missing when Della and Jasmine are on their literary tour of England and has the full glare of publicity, the bloodhounds are out, the police are bending all their resources to try to find this little girl, whereas you, uh, your character, Della, is told by the police, oh, maybe she's gone walkabout, as you said. So um, it, it, it's quite stark in this book, um, the, the, the difference in the treatment uh, between the two cases. And the other thing that struck me um, when I first read it was the way Della herself was almost the, um, you know, there was almost more focus on her parenting than on the culpability of the offender during the court case. Um, and she was asked, well, why do you why do you sleep with your kids? That sort of thing. Could you tell us a little bit about that as well? I think and I think that's a fairly universal thing for a lot of victims of crime. And of course, we include the families of somebody who's been murdered as a victim of crime, um, that they are treated like they are a suspect. And it's not unusual as as people would know that when there is a murder the people who are closest to somebody are the first people to be investigated so there is a part of the process that is that is rightly interrogating people um, to work out what's going on but then there are a range of ways that people can very much feel like um, there are additional assumptions around that um, and again these this is um something that i felt was authentic in how i wrote these events because i saw them uh, play out in some, some in many criminal justice cases that I've 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 worked on, um, and particularly because it's sort of merging that in the child protection space, they are exactly the kind. There, there is a, still a, a a range of um, assumptions made about Aboriginal parenting that you see all the time. And if I can give you a, a, a good example that I see all the time in the casework around child protection is equating poverty with neglect. And for people who come from a fairly middle-class white background and have gone through university and then they have to go and assess an Aboriginal family, there are things they see that they don't understand and they assume it's neglect. So for example, um, somebody not having money in the bank has been treated as neglect. Um, and another th place that this comes up, which I used in the book as well, and was very much um, how my childhood was during the summers when I was out of Sydney in Aborig more in Aborig other Aboriginal communities, where you would sleep one night in one house and one night in another house and one night in another house, but everyone knew where you were and particularly the kids all looked after each other. But people from outside look at that and think they're, those kids are running wild, whereas, in fact, living the communal parenting is a very big part of the Aboriginal community, as is having a house where people come and, you know, stay, family members move through. So the idea that having a lot of people in the house is the equivalent to overcrowding and that equals neglect is also something we see. So they are all actual examples from cases that we've worked on where children have been removed and, and when we've challenged it, the, there has been a determination that the child should never have been removed. But I see that a lot and I can see that intersection between the two. And, and I think just in the, in the context of the crime writing scenario, um, I think it's important to remember, I always see those two systems as being really linked um, they are both, in a, in a way, in a kind of um, uh, structural way, we talk about the removal of children as part of the colonisation process and then the incarceration over incarceration is another part of that. So those systems work in that way. But I think even more fundamentally in this context, what we do know is that when children go into out-of-home care, they have a much higher likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system. Their behaviour that if they're in a loving family home and they're acting out is treated as, um, as exactly that. And so discipline is the response to that. In and out of home setting, it's highly likely that that behaviour is criminalised and they end up going towards juvenile justice systems. So if you look at the makeup of Dondale at the time of the Royal Commission, 60% of the kids in Dondale were in out of home care. They were in the care of the state. So there is a really high correlation. So I, I, I always feel just 
because I'll keep use, probably using examples from both, that for me, those two systems are really linked and I can't really talk about one without talking about the other. Yeah, um, and there's there's such a an unwillingness, though, uh, on, on behalf of some of the people in the book to sort of look at Della and the way she parents um, and accept that, say, for example, co-sleeping with her daughters is just she loves it they love it they love each other and it's a happiness thing whereas even her her lawyers seem to be looking at it on it as a you know something that's a bit weird and might indicate something else um and I remember as well you said in the book um uh with the character of uh of Jimmy in particular that when the little girl's body is found, thankfully there was DNA evidence around it. Otherwise the assumption would have been that her father had killed her. So that must be, I mean, that must be such a mountain to climb, an additional mountain that other people don't have to climb to face those sorts of prejudices. Yeah, I, I think it is a, an additional layer and and and. You know, I think it's fair to say, and I, I explore this in the book as well, that a lot of those c c communities or families inevitably have an additional layer of trauma. It is It would be unusual if there hasn't been some element of the removal policy that's been an impact on their lives. So there's, you know, there's a, a range of ways in which you're already dealing with communities that are dealing with a lot of trauma and this, this sort of re-traumatises it. And, of course, I think one thing that the... Uh, First Nations community has become much more um, astute about it, having experienced it and now trying to find a name for it is this concept of intergenerational trauma and that that of course is something that's looked at here both in relation to how you know how trauma from the generation before leads to a range of socioeconomic circumstances but even how the trauma of losing a child in a family is a trauma that gets transmitted down to the other children in the family and, and becomes it's an intergenerational trauma that way so it, it always is uh, striking to me that there are those layerings you know and, and you know organizations like the healing foundation for example are now starting to I think do really important good work uh, in terms of the sorts of reports they're commissioning that help um, describe this and 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 give a name to it so that people you know, know how to describe what's happening to them because they've seen it. And I mean, I guess the first time I saw it too, you know, feeling very privileged that after two generations of removal in my family, my brother and I, uh, you know, stayed with our parents and had a great childhood. But um, when I first became a lawyer, I could see that the the women who were losing their children to the state were often third, fourth generation of, of the gener stolen generations. Um, and so they're losing them in different circumstances now, not to a formal government policy, but sometimes I look at it and when you think about the sorts of assumptions I was talking about before about seeing a, a black child and, and assuming it's neglect and it's the parents before asking another question, it does make me wonder how different the ideologies are and perhaps not that different after all. Yeah, and there's another, um, I mean, th the murders are the central crimes in this book, but they're not the only crime. And you write about a character called Fiona McCoy, who um, was appallingly uh, abused as a child um, and has since committed a murder. And your character, Jasmine, makes the point that the people who created her pay no price at all and all of the prices on her shoulders. Can you tell us a little about Jasmine, about Fiona and, and how Jasmine is trying to help her? Yeah, I guess it was, um, it was a, um, something that, that I guess in looking at this, I, I was aware of the complexities and, um, you know, I felt like it was really important to also be looking at um, the, the ways in which um, you know, I think until very recently, we have not been very good at dealing with child sexual assault and incest in particular. Like these are two areas where um, it's underreported and it's underprosecuted. Um, and often where it comes up is when you have somebody who is sitting in prison uh, as an offender, and then it comes out that that's been part of their past and it's been a part of their past that hasn't been dealt with. And I guess I was... I was having worked with victims of crime 
am not make did not want to make excuses for people who commit them despite their background, but I think it's complex. And I think it's interesting having worked in a system, I should also add that part of the um, you know, the, the things I drew on for this came out of my work on the Serious Offenders Review Council, which I sat on for a long period of time. And so, as the name implies, spoke to many serious offenders. And it was rare that, that, that there wasn't some kind of uh, trauma in the, in the background. And there are programs in prison that deal with sexual offending behaviour but there were no programs when I worked there that prisoners could access to deal with their own abuse. Now think about that. I have a very cynical view about sex offender programs as I saw them roll out. Uh, I think it's a very complex area and I guess it's one of the things where we don't understand really perhaps deeply enough how somebody's mind works when they commit those kind of crimes, but which means we, we perhaps don't know how to perhaps deal with them and I'm not an expert in that area but I guess as somebody who was a lawyer and practicing in the area I found it really confronting and very confusing and I guess the the um the you know one of the things that struck me was how well people were able to hide their criminal behavior I mean you'd be familiar with this that you would find somebody who had been um a, a, a sexual predator within a family would have uh, abused generations and siblings and people would not have realised until much later on to show the level of manipulation. Um, and so there's all this kind of behaviour that goes on that we that, that people get away with because we are unable to call it out or people are unable to confront it. Um, so I just felt like it was something that I, I wanted to look at because it felt like it was really complex and you do see... Um, you know, and I took I took that from a couple of the cases where it was female serious offenders who had done, you know, unforgivable crimes, but you looked at their childhood and their, you know, the material that was available from their time in state care, and you just would wonder what, you know, if a child has a venereal disease from, you know, a very young age, you wonder what sort of chance they ever had in the first place. So I guess for me it was a way of just saying that, that part of the prevention and the intervention um, is, is, is an important part of the story. If we're talking about how we deal with victims of crime, there is something upon us that makes, means that we should probably try and do better at the early intervention stage. Yeah, and it's um, uh, another, you know, another aspect to that is Jasmine, would I be correct in saying that part of her is desperate to get away from her upbringing and her background. Um, uh, she's a city lawyer and uh, she uh, has stayed away from her hometown of Frog Hollow for a while. Um, and throughout the course of the novel, I mean, one of the, uh, this novel is so many things, it really is. Um, and part of it is a terrific uh, jaunt around the literary sites of England um, where you're weaving, you know, <clears throat> the writers that, that we encounter uh, on this tour together with your, with your own characters and the themes. And that, that is a, it exists on, on many levels and that is one of the levels that it exists on. But throughout this journey, Jasmine and Della, her mother Della, um, come to perhaps understand each other a little bit more and we see that Della, who would you say Jasmine's kind of dismissive of her at first? Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, I, we get to know her wisdom a bit more, but also Jasmine finds out something about Della's past quite late in the book, uh, which actually had a bearing on what happened to Brittany as a child. Um, would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Or I know, I feel like spoilers? we've talked about all the very dark themes and actually there is this whole literary tour there with is, Jane yeah. Austen and the Brontes. And lots of and morning teas. Lots of morning teas and fabulous characters on the yeah. tour. And um, So <laughs> I don't want to give you the wrong impression that, it's a, that, it, that that is, I mean, it sits, I mean, and I guess in fact it was important to me in looking at such dark themes to have the lightness in there as many of you and I think one of the big mechanisms many Aboriginal people use in relation to dealing with trauma is humour and that very good senses of humour. 
Um, and the other thing, of course, is understanding the importance of storytelling. So at the at the heart of it, you know, um, although, as I said, the the stories in the book are really inspired by my own work in those in the criminal justice system and child protection system. Um, the thing that drew me to wanting to write it was looking at the concept of storytelling and comparing that literary tradition, which like Jasmine, I grew up with and, and, and loved and still love. In fact, it was a wonderful part of researching the book to go back and read a lot of those books. And for the most part, found I'd forgotten how much I loved them, how well written they were, how well structured Jane Austen is, how innovative Virginia Woolf was, you know, just, I just really enjoyed that part of it. Um, but I come from a First Nations culture where storytelling is an oral tradition. Storytelling is a critical part of that. It's been a critical part of how we keep our story and our law and our traditions. It's become a critical part of how we talk about trauma. Um, and, and it be, has become a, a really important part of the um, what I like to call the renaissance of Indigenous culture as we're now in a process of really, you know, quite proactively um, reweaving our communities, language programs, possum cloak making, all of these things. And I'm sure um, since we're all readers here, would ob obviously the kind of renaissance of First Nations writing that we're seeing, all of this is kind of a really big part of my own culture, but it was a part of a culture that wasn't visible to me and wasn't around and accessible, um, particularly the writing, the picking up a book. Um, there weren't there weren't Anita Heiss and Tony Birch back then, but there were Jane Austen and there were Thomas Hardy and there was Charles Dickens. So I guess one of the things I wanted to sort of celebrate in a way was that as a young First Nations person trying to understand the world around me, I actually did learn a lot about sexism from Jane Austen and the Brontes. I, said, I learned a lot about how class systems works from Dickens. Um, George Orwell doesn't get much of a run in the book, but I think Burmese Days is one of the best books about colonisation to this day. So I did want to sort of not say this, this tradition is, is less. I guess what I wanted to do to, was to sort of celebrate that tradition, but to also say sitting side by side with that for me is this other amazing tradition. And even those dreamtime stories, as people call them, that sort of seem like children's stories, if you understand the complexities of those stories and they're, stole, they're told in their, in their entirety, and I, so I only include two in the book, you start to break them down and they tell you all about things like what medicines you can use, where people meet, um, you know, how the seasons work, what flower is coming that tells you the season's changing. These are really complex stories. So it was a little bit of that. And I think I've gone away from your question no, that's a, on, that's this, all right. on this little tour. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad you brought it up though, because you do include um, uh, two stories in there and you make the point that you know you're on this th th you take us on this tour of London uh where you have this sort of written literary tradition but then the oral tradition that you're talking about dates back 7,000 years 65 but, but, uh, no 65 sorry but there are stories from 7,000 years oh, yeah. ago you were saying in the book that that scholars have have um, suggested that uh, seven thousand years uh, events from seven thousand years ago are still present in storytelling. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. We did have that conversation. Yeah, that, that that they can, apart from the fact you can see in stories where the ice age has come in. So, um, just for example, there's a wonderful Darrell story on the flannel flower, which you can just Google and find by the wonderful Arnie Fran Bodkin telling it. And there's a thing about how all the flowers are frozen. So this thing about how the theory is that it's as old as that, but they go back and they explain, they can explain things like volcanoes or, or other seismic things that people haven't, scientists haven't realized has happened. And then they go back and they're like, oh my goodness, they're right here in the stories. And it's, uh, it's, an, ama it's an amazing thing that, um, you have that catalogue of, um, of knowledge and there's something about, you know, when you think about the fact that you can play that Chinese whispers game and so by the time you're at the end of the row, the story is different, but these stories remain, there are um, ways of, of uh, keeping the memory of them so that they're incredibly intact and they don't move over time. Um, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing and I have to say it was something that I didn't know growing up as a child, 
and the more I've explored the complexity of this storytelling through through my work and the traveling around the country and hearing stories and 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 talking to people like Arnie Fran um it, it's it, it's just incredible what cult, what this culture is so there was a part of me that was really about you know when when you write a book like this there's a lot that's where you're writing it for a first nations audience where you want it to be resonating with people who've had who've had the same experiences of you but our stories aren't told but there's a large part I think that hopes that it will speak to a non-Indigenous audience who are genuinely curious about our culture and that this is the sort of thing that you can read and think this, there's so much more to this and you know credit to Bruce Pascoe for the work he's done in raising awareness that there's much more in Indigenous culture than people gave it credit for. Yeah, um, absolutely. And this idea of naming as well. Um, uh, naming seems to me, I don't know whether you agree, to be a bit of a focus uh, of, of the narrative in terms of, you know, from Jasmine wanting to change the way her name is spelled all the way to through uh, Della not wanting to utter the name of her do- her daughter's killer because it's like a curse. Is that is was that something that was consciously there, and is is it an important theme to you? Um, you know, I think when you're talking about storytelling, you're really cognizant of the power of the word, and you know, in a lot in lots of ways that we, you know, that we know that um, they can. I mean, I guess the the thing within the book is both that they can. Um, cause harm and hurt but they can also be a huge way of healing and and for me with Jasmine particularly who's called called Jazzy when she's young um, that, that's her legal name and she as you said Meg she's got this desire to get away from her family and becoming Jasmine is a way of um, you know doing that there's um, she becomes aware he's um, you might be aware too that they do these um, sort of research projects or surveys that show that if people have kind of African-American names, they're less likely to get asked for a job interview and people with very Anglo-Celtic names higher likely, offer, offer, just offer CV to get a call back. And, and to her, it's sort of is the, is the uh, embarrassment of having these kind of names that are quite common in, in particularly now in Aboriginal communities um, that are uh, sort of cr- created by families and, and much more about how they sound. Um, and, you know, for her overall, I think, I think the thing that I tried to capture with her is that um, there is a way in which the racism around you that she's experiencing the town, she sees the way, the racism in this town that has been, is, is historic, has been the reason why her sister's murder wasn't um, investigated and has been the reason why her family is treated differently. And her response to that racism that she also grows up with is to try and conform. And there are almost like two ways that that people, um, when we look at sort of our big cultural figures or our, our literary figures, our archetypes, if you like, you have the warrior who challenges the system like your Pema Woy, or you have the person who's the diplomat and tries to navigate it like the Benelong. And in a way, the sisters, um, so um, Jasmine and her sister Leanne are those, are those archetypes. There's a, there is a warrior who confronts everyone and calls them out and is quite, you know, physical in her, in her defence of herself and her family. And Jasmine, who is quiet and tries to conform. And I guess I was interested in what the challenges are and... Um, you know, the, the, the false hope of the conformity. Um, and, and I think for me, a big part of what Jasmine is looking at on the, on the tour, which, which she's not expecting, I guess, is not just about what her relationship to her mother is, although the things are tied together, but just, you know, coming to terms with those choices she's made about being a conformist and, and what she's had to compromise and deny of herself of who she is in doing that. Um, 
and I think I've again just wandered away from your question. Now, Starting I, my own race <coughs> over here. I, I, lo I love where you wander. I will happily follow you on your wanderings. <laughs> um, and we're talking about the tour. Um, if you are a writing, as, as soon as I read this book, I knew Larissa was a writing tragic. And um, <laughs> Uh, you, you will be left in uh, in no doubt as well. And as a fellow writing tragic and writers are my rock stars, when I re meet a writer who I admire, I sort of blather incoherently and then realise how much I'm blathering and run away. Um, <laughs> that's my response. So if you love books and writers, you will, you will absolutely love this. And I love the way that you pick out the themes from, you compare Leanne, uh, Jasmine's sister, who you've just, uh, described as the warrior, you compare it to Tess of the D'Urbervilles um, as a romantic sufferer, and I can absolutely see that in her in her character, uh, because there is a particular type of person who almost relishes being the you know the the archetypal sufferer, um, and the pet that. The minor characters on this tour, the characters that Jasmine and Dill, I call them minor characters, but they actually bring different aspects out in both of the main characters and they accompany them on the tour and they're just wonderfully drawn there is for example the professor who keeps contradicting the tour guide and giving lectures nobody really wants to hear we have all met him yeah. <laughs> we all know that guy yeah <laughs> um what did you did you have a particular purpose in mind for the minor characters on the tour with them and where did you draw them from? how did you draw them out um yeah, it's, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges as, as writers in the room will know, especially if you're doing something that's sort of a bit historical or like this where you've, you've done a lot of research and, um, you know, we went, my husband and I went and visited all the spots and we did the tour so that we could, I could work out how the tour would work because it wasn't an actual tour. Um, and so that there's the balance of how much of the, the that you've learnt do you put in there you want to tell everyone how much you know about this and what the lampshade looks like and what the fork looks like and you've just got to kind of pull back and I think the other thing that was a bit of a challenge too was how much of those characters do you do you bring in and um, I mean it, 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 for me I guess also having been in academia there was a nice way in which having a, a couple of academics to kind of play out that thing about there's a whole um, challenge to traditional academia about having uh, new voices and new perspectives come in and you know our, our professor is on the tour because he wants to kind of update what he's getting challenged about from people coming into his classes um, and and then also having other academics there who you know in in the same institutions are feeling like uh, because of their gender or their background they're not progressing and I think both both things can be true um, so that it was a kind of place to play there. But the other thing, the Boston sisters were actually real sisters. My mum and I had done a couple of these types of tours, though never that one. And I did them when I was quite We've all young. We met with them it. too. And I met them and I never, <laughs> as you can see, I never forgot them. <laughs> they were a classic. Um, so they, they, I felt like they deserved a place in, in, uh, in there. Um, but I guess for me too, it was surrounding, particularly with Della, um, who is not academic and hasn't read any of the books. The only thing she knows about them is what she's seen on the TV adaptations. So she knows the stories from that. So her re responses to things are much more emotional and visceral, but still very wise. And so it was a sort of deliberate ploy to have her surrounded by people who would dismiss her because she did not have that same background. And so to populate the world with people who would see her as invisible and be dismissive. So, you know, there's a, the, the point at the, in the book where Della finds her voice when she tells one of the stories um, to Meredith, who's actually one of my, my favourite minor character, the, the North Shore um, woman who, who by her constant curiosity on Indigenous culture, which in some ways Della finds exhausting, is actually the trigger to Della realising how much she's actually learned, how much she's taken on, but she's never because she's always been learning it, she's never been the one to speak it. And that, that moment when she starts to become confident in her own voice and realise what she knows is kind of a wonderful moment for me, but I don't think it works unless you can see how invisible and how underestimated she is in the world around her. Mm. Yeah, that is wonderful when she starts telling the story 
and I love what you uh, you know what you put in there too about needing to be ready to listen um uh, I could go on all day about this book but I'm sure people have questions and in in just a little while we'll be um uh, opening to questions those on uh zoom if you have any questions now would be a good time to pop them in the chat um and we'll start the q a shortly um uh but uh i just had one other question before we get to that which is one of the things i loved about della even though she is the woman who is overlooked and ignored because she doesn't have formal education she is so conscientious on that tour. She is always taking notes. She's got her gardening book that she looks plants up in. Um, I wonder, do you think, what do you think Della would have been if she'd had the same opportunities that Jasmine had? I sort of imagine that she would have, because she, she is a nurturer, um, that she would have done something. So I think that's why the idea of having a garden which she'd never really thought about until she goes to see all the beautiful gardens that are around her. Um, and even then it is another trigger for remembering some of the things that she's been taught by the elders, particularly Arnie Elaine, who's a presence who's passed on in the book, but is, is very much a presence. Um, I sort of thought she'd do something like perhaps be a vet, something where she would look after things. She was, um, yeah, that, that, but that part of her about always wanting to help and, um, you know, I th think she was very much of that that um, persuasion that if you could do anything to help someone, you would do it. Yeah, that, that she is she is such a strong character. Even though when the book starts, you don't think she's going to be a strong character, but she's just so grounded and present in everything. She's extraordinary. I love her. And it's not a huge revelation that Jasmine, being a lawyer, educated, etc., is more like me. <laughs> But I actually found her much harder to write than I found Della. I found I could feel Della. And maybe it's that thing about listening. She was the voice of a couple of uh, Aboriginal women who'd been very important to me. And when I could hear them talking to me the way that they would describe the world in that kind of wisdom, um, where you really have to think about what they've said to get the depth of it. Um, that her voice came quite naturally to me. And I, you know, in a way I had to, it, I feel like it is Della's book. We always have this thing in, in screenwriting that if the person who, ch who changes the most from where they are at the beginning of the film to where they are at the end, that, that's the person whose story it is. And that's not always the same with, with literature, but I feel like if that was the test for this, then it's definitely Della who's realised that she's at the beginning of her own eldership and, Jasmine still has learned some things, but she's got a, a long way to go. And, um, you know, I felt to me that that was through her voice and the way that she sees the world, that it was a, a real chance to kind of explore that difference with um, uh, in, in the way that Aboriginal people tell stories. So even I think um, one of the big impacts, I think, of Indigenous people working in the professions and in academia now is that Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous methodologies have become a very big way that research is done. And there's a range of them. And some of them are around concepts of storytelling and some of them are around the concepts of deep listening. And it does strike me in terms of how people interview people that the deep listening idea is, is really important. So if you ask an elder a question, like, you know, um, why is the sky blue? And they give you an answer that's got something to do with something completely different, like, you know, you know, you have to go and have a look at X, Y, and Z. And you're kind of frustrated because you wanted an answer about the sky. You don't get to go, okay, well, I'll do that, but tell me about the sky. You have to think about why is it that I'm being told this? And you have to go away and you work it out. And eventually you work out why going over there and learning that will teach you about what you've actually asked. Whereas when we get people to go and do these interviews as a researcher, they'll just have a list of questions. Don't necessarily always listen to the answer either and they just duck down. And if you don't get the answer to the question you want, people tend to think, well, I didn't get the answer and they don't think about it any further. So there's that aspect to it. And even in the methodology, you know, there's a way in which people will do an interview get it transcribed, come back and look at the transcription. There's even these things where they will put in key words and then their text will all be come back to them where those words appear. 
And that is just um, the complete antithesis to how you would do deep listening. So what I always make my students do, for better or for worse, is they do the transcribing because when they go back and listen again, it's another time that they're listening. And I don't let them use that software because they don't make the connections. It means if you don't use that word, but you're talking about it differently, you don't pick it up. So all of those steps get skipped. So I think there are ways, it's another, just another way in which these concepts, these Aboriginal knowledge concepts can really help and change the way we do things where we thought we've done them really well for a really long time. I'm learning about this every day. I feel like it's such a privilege to be part of this culture, I tell you. Well, you're teaching us about it through your, through your book as well, which I, for one, am very grateful for. Um, now, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Um, I'll just uh, just before we before we start, I just need to reiterate that question uh, for the people on Zoom who wouldn't have heard it. So the gentleman was asking if the RISA could uh, talk about the moment when she realised how she could encapsulate this uh, um, in the story of the tour. It's such a great question, and um, I always feel like I know the characters and the thematics before I know the plot though I did know very early on that I wanted to do this tour the tour was kind of the thing that helped me consolidate to start writing but then I had a lot of kind of challenges in terms of getting it all to um to to um work together and what's the timing of how I'm revealing different aspects of the story and where does it come out um, and in, in particular, the Oxford um, uh, story, which I've focused on Alice in Wonderland, and partly because that magic realism is, is quite equatable to the magic realism of Dreamtime stories. So I kind of, in, my instinct was this, this will be great, but it took me months and months to work out how to, how to work it. And so um, one of the things I love about your question is that there's a lot of challenges around the craft. So the, the answer was kind of just perseverance and trying to work it through and re-threading how those stories worked. But I think the real answer to the question came when, um, with all of those struggles about how different aspects of the story worked, I was, I mean, this book took me a long time, maybe eight years to write. So I was constantly saying to my publisher, Madonna Duffy at UQP, um, oh, you know, it's going to be this great book and it's all inspired by my work in the criminal justice system. When people asked what it was about, I'd say, yes, it's about my work in the criminal justice system. We've been chatting and you can see it's clearly about that. But then I had this one moment where I was, so I'd say it's the least autobiographical thing I've ever written because my first two novels are very much about my relationship with my father. And then I was about, I don't know, almost about eight months before I finished writing it, I was having the usual, yeah, it's about this and it's about that and it's not autobiographical. And I just had this moment where I thought, oh, my God, this is totally about me and my mother. <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he was not, he's not, none of the characters are crafted on her, but, it, you know, that's the thing about what, what, what is subconscious. And, and, and when I realised that, it actually made it a lot easier to write the rest of the book. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. You're right. It's not the easiest question of the world to paraphrase, but it's a very important one. So thank you for asking um, asking it. And for the people on Zoom, we're talking about. Uh, uh, the, the link between um, the treatment of Indigenous people by police and incarceration and the criminal justice system? It's such a great question because it is, it, it is it can be seen as a tension and, and the other, in another way, it, 
what it does is it brings out two different facets that continue to explain why we have overrepresentation. And one is the use of bias in judgment making. When you've got a decision, you can do A or B and you do A instead of B. And, and if it was a different coloured person in front of you, you would have done something different. Um, and, and, you know, the, the kind of examples from the child protection system are similar in that. Um, and, and perhaps even more so when you throw in things like racial profiling, um, over policing practices, and not just in towns like um, Dubbo and, and the like, but, you know, the sorts of issues that you would have with the police in Redfern when I was growing up are the sorts of things we see every day in Marrickville now. So um, that, that kind of uh, discretion um, is, a, is a reflection of bias in decision making and perhaps a bit of, 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 cult, of the culture of those institutions and those professions and, and speaks to the fact that we have not done what we need to do in terms of education and, and cracking those biases and making people aware of both their, their particularly that what we would call un, unconscious bias, which um, many people would say is just another way of saying racism. But um, so there's that aspect. And then I think, as, as you rightly say, then you see these other aspects of the system like the um, things like mandatory sentencing, or I think another good example is um, tighten, tightening of bail laws, where it is it is known, um, and people who work in those areas uh, on the ground in academia, researchers, experts all say, don't do this, or you will get more Indigenous people coming into prison, and they do it anyway. The tough on crime um, approach is completely uh, inconsistent with wanting to reduce the number of Aboriginal people in, in, um, in custody. And, and I think what it speaks to is that um, it, it's important to realise that there is that systemic racism in those systems and people get kind of uh, nervous or dismissive of the term structural racism. But I think if you can look at a system like the criminal justice system or the child protection system, and getting more Indigenous lawyers, more Indigenous judges, more Indigenous people working in the courts, more Indigenous prisoners, uh, prison officers, more Indigenous um, uh, police, and you still don't see any changes in those statistics. In fact, they continue to worsen. It's a good sign that there's something structurally racist. It's not about just the people in there, but something is wrong with the system. Or if you fall asleep on a train and end up dead. I could probably fall asleep on a train and not end up dead, but um... it's just on that too. It's it's the other point that's really worth bearing in mind too is that it, the discrimination in the criminal justice system, as I said, you can't, I can't look at it without thinking about the intersection with child protection. You can't look at it without looking at the discrimination in the health system as well. And you look at cases like Jalika Do's um, case where both the criminal justice system and the medical system failed her. What was interesting about that, so that was a death in custody where this poor woman who, who had been picked up by the police when a domestic violence, um, a call about a domestic violence incident had happened. Her partner was, who had a history of abusing her, had, had turned up. So she was uh, in, in a domestic, being a domestic violence victim because she had unpaid fines, the police arrested her too and put her in the lock the lockup. During her time there, she complained several times about having pains, which were sort of dismissed. She was taken to the hospital where she was seen in that they looked at her and saw an Aboriginal woman, assumed that she was coming off drugs and wanted drugs, so didn't even physically um, treat her, sent her back, and, of course, she passed away in prison. The last images of her coming into the hospital uh, handcuffed and she's passed away a uh, horrendous. Oh. But what, what, so the coronial inquest found that she had septicemia probably from an earlier injury from the domestic violence. So it was completely treatable. And I just used that terrible example um, for, from a family who was also one of those families that is continually trying to get justice for this horrendous thing that happened to their, their loved daughter, sister, granddaughter, as well as um, trying to make sure it doesn't happen again. But what's interesting in the inquest is, as you can see from that story, there were failures from the criminal justice side and there were failures from the medical side. And sitting through the coronial inquest, it was really interesting that the police didn't deny that there had been 
kind of a racial bias in how they'd acted, but kept blaming somebody else. Like it wasn't me, it was it was this guy. It was the guy who'd ended up leaving the police that he was the guys. But they didn't ever say racism isn't a problem. And the medical practitioners were basically unable to admit that anything was racist about how they behaved. We treat everyone equally. So I think in, in just as a slight defence, <laughs> I think there's been a lot more self-reflection and um, in, more informed conversation and a deeper analysis of what's going on structurally in the criminal justice system, particularly given the, the long shadow that the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody is, is, is providing, um, that other professions actually who are just as complicit. There were a lot of those deaths in that deaths in custody that were medical deaths, um, were uh, avoidable medical deaths, uh, where those conversations still uh, in a much more embryonic place. Just very disturbing. Um, are there are there any more quick yes? Look, it's it's a oh. um, the, yes. The question was in regard to the Bail Act and whether uh, times of trauma, times when something appalling has occurred, is is a good time to be discussing the impact of um, these sorts of changes on uh, Aboriginal communities. Look, it's a good question, and in two ways, I, I I can't think of a time when there's been a proposed change to that kind of legislation where there haven't been groups very active in in alerting what the consequence of that be. At the very least, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services are very good at 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 that at being able to pinpoint, and I've never known them to ever be silent, no matter what the context is. But the other thing that is obviously a factor in that is, is how do, I think particularly leaders in our community and politicians use those moments for their own advantage. If they are going to use that to support their tough on crime approaches because they know that gets them jobs, those narratives get them jobs, then, you know, I think that's part of the, part of the problem. Um, there are times when it's the, the voices of, um, you know, our really great advocates are heard much more strongly and there are many times mo most times they're drowned out I think the one thing about the Black Lives Matter movement that was triggered by of course George Floyd's death but because of the circumstances with David Dungay's death have had a particular resonance of and allowed Australians to see that there was a there was a real correlation here was an ex was an extraordinary moment and I say that both in sense of having been somebody who'd been marching against deaths in custody since I was a child and thought that's just what you did on a Saturday, to actually then seeing how many people turned up during that time was just in, inspiring and, and, and breathtaking. But um, having said that, you, what, you, what, what I can't see is how that's translated. We're still seeing almost a death in custody. It's, 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 it, we, we could have said it's, it's monthly. I think it's actually a bit quicker than that now. So we still have these issues. Um, I, I feel like that, that there are those moments when, when other people get it. But um, the, the tragedy is that not only do you have those great advocates like the people at the ALS and, and various people in the profession who are really great at that, you also have um, a range of parliamentary inquiries. I mean, we've had several just in New South Wales around a range of things. The same people, my team, everyone else who puts in, we put in them to, in um, submissions to almost every every inquiry we can. We say the same things, and very, very little happens. Um, so, 
as I said, you just have to say when you keep making all this effort and nothing changes, there's got to be something systemic. And so how do we how do we do do that? We've got, uh, because we started late, uh, we've got time for one more um, quick question. So uh, I'll just add uh, for the people on Zoom, um, the lady was just rightly pointing out um, that Larissa is pretty impressive and has an incredible legal and uh, academic career. So why write novels? What a great question. And thanks for that great paraphrase. Um, <laughs> Um, I've, it, it's, it's a good question. I, I became a lawyer to change the world and I realised pretty quickly that being a family lawyer at Parramatta in Legal Aid was not going to do that. So it made me really rethink how I would do this. And I, one of the reasons I went back to academia was because when I was at law school, it was the first time I really started to write and become very involved in politics, sort of found my own voice. So I very much enjoyed that space. But I still found that I was doing that thing of putting all the submissions in and saying all this stuff and nothing changed. And actually, the big thing for me, my first novel is about the impact of the removal policy. And I left Australia just in 1990, just at the end of 92. So I'd seen the Redfern Park speech and had this moment of um, being actually there and feeling like I was there at a moment in history, which of course it was, but I thought it was going to be a moment where think things had changed and then I went overseas and studied the bringing them home report came out Howard came in he came in he came down just as he was in so his government got to do the response so this this issue that had defined my family their response to that infuriated me it was only one in ten you can't say it's genocide blah blah um and, and I felt then that I wanted to write something about what its impact had been on my family. So my first being drawn into, like she started to write it as a nonfiction, but because there were so many gaps in my family because of that policy, and because there were some things that were really hard to talk about. And I felt once I was writing them, I don't think, I, I, I'm, I don't think it's fair that I say this because it impacts on other people in my family. I started to think about writing it as fiction. That was my first novel, Home. And my second one was a similar thing where I wanted to write, my, my father passed away after that book came out and I wanted to write about how extraordinary people like him were who came from these backgrounds where they grew up in orphanages and then became these people who were real game changers. So dad went on not only to find our family history, but set up Link Up and helped other people find their families. He was also the first Aboriginal teaching fellow at the University of New South Wales, which he did because of his cultural knowledge, he never finished high school. So these extraordinary people, but the things that, that, that equipped them to be able to survive what they'd been through and to, to succeed were the very things that made them very flawed people in their private lives. So again, something that I, I wrote from a place of love because I was going through the process of mourning him. And I, you know, he defined me and I love him very dearly, but it was a way of me kind of coming to terms with that. And again, I felt like saying that as a non-fiction book was invasive, but I felt like I really wanted to say it. So I found that fiction is a great space for that. And similarly with this, I thought there were thematics there where if I used the real examples that I was bringing together, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's my story to tell. But there were things that I'd seen that I feel really strongly about that I want to raise. And there's also things I want to celebrate. And so that sort of draws me to it. So in a way, whether I choose to do something as film, as documentary or write fiction or non-fiction, it's often the content of the story that will define it rather than me thinking I want to write in this, in this mode, what's the story? I feel like the story kind of defines it and um, it's been a good complement to, I guess, the other thing. So my, I would say in one way my advocacy developed from, from realising it's not just about the law but it's also about the hearts and minds and telling the stories that are going to, help people connect and that's been a really similar thing that I've found through documentary filmmaking where you train to be a lawyer you advocate for somebody and you speak for them and you're kind of translating their story into the format that the court can understand helping them navigate how they tell their story in that system and doing fil films like Innocence Betrayed which we did with the Barraville families or um, after the apology, which is the film I did with um, some of the women who I've worked with in the child protection system. Um, and that, that film is still on um, SBS On Demand, if you want to have a look at it. 
it, it helped me realise that there's another part of advocacy for change where, although, you know, us lawyers can be pretty persuasive, not as persuasive as somebody who's actually experienced a real injustice and you get to see that person and empathise with them and say, how could that have ever happened to her? Um, that feels really important to me. So I feel like it's been an evolution of my activism in some ways, but also a deeper appreciation of how storytelling in both of those things are perhaps the thing that helps make the structural change that just writing more reports for the parliamentary inquiries isn't doing. <laughs> One can live in hope. <laughs> Uh, well, look, thank you so much for that. And I'm afraid that's all we have uh, we have time for. Larissa will be available to sign copies of her books opposite the library bookshop just outside the room. And even if your next session is in this room, we do ask that you leave so we could, so the room can be can be cleaned um, and COVID made COVID safe again. Um, if that's an issue, please speak to one of the volunteers. Enjoy the rest of the festival. There are tickets to the other events for sale um, at the festival reception table opposite the Library Cafe. And finally, please join me in thanking Larissa Berendt.